Number one concern around national security uh, at the moment, Ryan, is around uh, uh, misinformation and disinformation. Social media companies are like DJs, and a good DJ controls the room. And it's insidious because you don't hear the music. You start sweating and you start quivering, getting angry, getting anxious. Or you even realize that there's a manipulation, there's a dark signature, there's a dark pattern behind the emotions that you feel as a consequence of feeding off the content. Yeah, that's why I don't go clubbing anymore. Why well, you shouldn't either. My main takeaways from the Web of Chaos documentary. I was born in 1977. Sanjana Hatatua is identified as being a disinformation specialist. Kate Hanna appears later as identified as director of the disinformation project. Can't help but think it's a bit dishonest not to point out that they're actually part of the same organization for those unaware. TDP are somewhat of a moral inquisition aligned with a pro-establishment worldview. The project's work to study clusters of nasty online interactions, then draw conclusions to influence social media companies, journalists, academia, policymakers, and civil society. Society. Initially, their existence was justified as a pandemic-related safety measure, though now everything comes under their jurisdiction. All of this gives us credence, this idea of scientific authenticity, without really explaining what's going on. My tone may seem prejudiced here, but I have given them a fair go. Over the last year, it's been a bit hard to get away from them, and they've given themselves away a bit, not least by their petulant response to the events of the last couple of days. Most of all, this stuff happened before that. What do you know about the disinformation project and the people behind it? and its connection to the Prime Minister and the government. A bit embarrassed to say I don't know a lot. I don't really find a lot of their work very rigorous. Um, it's, you know, I think they feel that, like they're on the right side of history and all they have to do is point out that there's all these horrible things going on. And so there's all sorts of things, nefarious, insidious things going on, dark designs on democracy that you don't want really to be happening and you really should be concerned about. To me, it's not a particularly sort of academic venture. It's kind of more of a moral crusade. I think I made a reasonable case for what drives them here, alternatively titled here by people better than me at marketing. That being said, I imagine they could have found a better picture. Anyway, Hatatua threw a completely irrational tantrum because of a throwaway comment. Which I guess makes the Prime Minister guilty of misinformation at the time. <laughs> and all that is, was part of a pattern drilled home in this interview, filmed after all that, advising that 1.8 million New Zealanders subscribe to extremist beliefs. We are seeing at the Disinformation Project individuals who are associated with neo-Nazism, violent ideology and extremism. It's also the network. If you take the fabric of democracy, what the Disinformation Project is looking at is about 1.8 million people across the country who are subscribed to these beliefs. It's not small. Based on recent polling, you could take a guess as to who he's talking about. Anyway, in a thing like this, there's probably not going to be too much diversity of thought between them when they co-write each other's work on the subject, so the documentary sort of artificially inflates the number of experts they've got to go to, and they were already sort of scraping the bottom of the barrel. Propaganda. What is it exactly? Back to the web of chaos. I set up South Asia's first Twitter account for civic journalism in 2007. And remember, this was the time of the Arab Spring. There's an apparent edit there. So maybe this was the filmmaker's fault and not how to tours, but taking it at face value, he says the Arab Spring was in 2007, even though commonly accepted as being three or four years later. This was the new digital Berlin Wall moment. It's heavily implied here that his work on Twitter helped pioneer that series of revolutions predominantly in North Africa and the Middle East, which may be true, I suppose, I don't know. It would make him a pretty big deal. This was the new digital Berlin Wall moment. But also would be a pretentious claim to make if his influence were at all exaggerated. Just another observation. Everything's a moment. I call this an unprecedented moment, a Christchurch earthquake moment, a Trojan horse moment. A very dramatic person. You start sweating and you start quivering. Not the best at analogies. Perhaps not exactly comparable when people lost their lives. People have lost their lives. This is something that President Biden has said very clearly. I'm a cultural historian and I'm particularly interested in the ways in which science and technology in the 20th and 21st century have replicated or increased disunity, racism, misogyny. And at heart, I'm really interested in these larger stories of disinformation. If you look at all of human history, now has no shortage of problems. Welcome to F-Boy Island. Woo! But for many people in many parts of the world, it could be the least racist, misogynistic time to be alive. Though I think this doom and gloom negativity and non-willingness to move forward may hint at the fear within permeating throughout this organisation. This segment of the documentary has done the rounds a bit, so apologies to those who have already seen it, but it's not like I couldn't show it. You can draw people in in lots of different places. And each of the platforms are used in different ways. Hello, 
friends. As you can see, I'm working on my Whitby bag. What is known internationally as a kind of trad wife set of viewpoints, which is white, Christian, a lot of pseudo-Celtic, pseudo-Nordic ideologies behind it. They use Pinterest and Instagram to draw in other women who are interested in interior design, children's clothing, knitting, healthy food for children. And it does draw people in towards a set of white nationalist ideas. I mean, it's relatively easy to see. If you see a very beautiful, fair-skinned, blonde or red-haired child with beautiful braiding in her hair and some flowers, just step back a little bit. <laughs> you wonder if she's about to clarify that, qualify it, reword it, but no, no. Which is really distressing because that's my heritage. I'm not crazy! This is a continuation of a theme from the other recent documentary, Fire and Fury. The role of women and, and wellness in fascist and proto-fascist movements has always been really significant. Uh, even in um, Italy and Germany in the 1920s, a lot of proto-fascist ideas came from or were augmented by ideas around health, well-being, rejection of modern medicine, um, you know, because obviously if you are um, an uber race, then um, you don't need modern medicine. Is she just making that up? She did say proto-fascist, but the bit at the end sounds a bit like an embellishment. Rejection of modern medicine. You know, because obviously if you are um, an uber race, then um, you don't need modern medicine. It goes a little bit against some other stuff out there, but she'd know best, I guess. I'm a cultural historian. As a historian, for me as a cultural historian, and you're asking a cultural historian. <laughs> I didn't make much of a deal about fire and fury at the time. It was sort of accidentally proactively dealt with by that disinfo pro nz video released about three weeks earlier published released <laughs> released yeah i released it overall web of chaos is probably better than fire and fury uses more interesting cutaway footage nicely edited her and stuff when it does that ominous music it's just chaos driven by these social media giants it's not as shameless as that eerie mouth of hell ambience like in fire and fury on fire and fury. As if the hackneyed title piggybacking on the hard work and passion of others wasn't enough. I thought it was more personal and a bit cruel, taking snapshots of people's lives during some of their probably more lower or desperate moments, calling them monsters and then putting them on blast like that. I wasn't threatening violence, I just wanted you to get out so that you could stop reporting um, lies. So you have no regrets about your role in that mob? I'm sorry, I don't have a problem. I, I did not. I have never threatened anybody. So how have we as a country got to the place where it's OK to respond to other people like this? These are angry um, and adrift people, and they deserve better from a journalist I used to admire, Paula Penfold, than that sneering, condescending condemnation that that program seemed to embody. Then there was all that projecting of internet personalities onto giant billboards and making it look like the people on the street were worshipping them. <laughs> The foreshadowing of a dystopic wasteland where disproportionately sized vehicles had all been flipped around because I guess there was too much disinformation or something. And I also thought it was suspicious that the documentary makers were ready to film the police advance on the protesters that final day, able to track them from up the street, catching multiple angles with their cameras all ready to go. I wonder how they were planning on wrapping up their documentary should that riot not have happened, presuming they had pitched their project to NZ On Air already and secured their public interest journalism funding before anyone knew that any of that was going to happen. Perhaps I'm reading too much into all that stuff because all up, that was probably the least of this documentary's crimes. You just spent 50 minutes trying to make the protesters look bad, quite unsuccessfully. None of it was convincing. But this little three second clip of some dude throwing a water jug at his own team, that's more effective than your 50 minute $300,000 documentary. Essentially, this whole thing only had to be three seconds long. Let's go. Web of chaos though, yeah. It's uncanny how successful the whole authoritarian social media ecosystem has been. The sense of deferred entitlement, members of a group who were traditionally privileged, and it seemed like that privilege was being withdrawn from them. 
They had what is often called authoritarian personality. The sort of protesters and politicians they're talking about are designated as having authoritarian mindsets, even though more and more lately, including in TDP's own material, anti-authoritarianism is the dangerous thing. Incidentally, dangerous protesters are lately being identified as even libertarian sometimes. Even libertarians. Like in this newsroom article in defense of Fire and Fury. Now disinformation merchants who use falsehoods to increase fear and misunderstanding as they build their libertarian armies of the ignorant want fair access to the public sphere. This is how my computer talks. Though that article also incorrectly asserts that the Trump presidency began in 2016, not 2017. So just a reminder, some people can project intellectual authority without really knowing what they are talking about. I digress. Just like with Fire and Fury, in Web of Chaos, everything builds up to the Wellington protest riot as if a definitive connection has been established. Even though the obsessive focus on white nationalism doesn't really explain the varying backgrounds of the protest participants and clashes with some of the perspectives of some other commentators who do draw attention to the anti-authoritarian themes. Part of the problem with this misinformation and this extremist content is, is not just that it is wrong, but that it puts the stakes so high that violence becomes rational. If you look at the Nazi occupation of Europe in, in the 1940s, it was rational to form an underground resistance that was violent and that attacked Nazi officials. Such contradiction is seamlessly smoothed over as we all get lost in the captivating action footage, so at any rate we get to this point without really knowing how we got to this point. Fictional anti-hero Trevor Phillips is invoked in Web of Chaos, but real-life arch-villain Trevor Mallard yet again does not get mentioned at all. I don't think they explicitly specify that opposition to vaccine mandate policy is the reason these people were here in the first place either, nor do they mention a bunch of other poignant factors that preceded the boil over, other than an abstract environment of anger and distrust. Or mistrust. Mistrust. With recorded history likely determined by cultural historians, It's a bit sad when you see them rewriting reality right in front of your eyes. And all this while supposedly waging a war on dishonest information. I have other takeaways. Religion comes up a bit. One religion a bit more so than others. Prime Minister Ardern would be the one who gets the most amount of violence directed at her on a daily basis. She's seen as a monster quite literally expressed as demonic and in a very Christian way, you know, satanic, it's evil, you can't negotiate with evil. Evangelical Christianity primes you to think that in this dimension, like all around me right now, like hidden is this fight between like good and evil. And when you hear the Norbies wake up and realize how many lies you've told, you won't be forgiven. You won't be forgiven. You have to. It's in the rules. I looked it up. I think if you must, you don't have to forget. A few minutes after all that, they transition to discussing psychosis while displaying serial killers. So read into that if you want. We used to talk about the internet as being a bit of a, an escape from the world. Now I, I like to use the real world as an escape from the internet. It's not that you're lonely, but you're very alone. Profoundly alone. I have a process, it sounds really silly, but as a historian, on a normal day, I might be going into the archives to do archival research. And when you go into the archives, lots of people don't know this, but um, you're supposed to have clean hands because you're touching um, you know, archival things. And so you go and wash your hands. So it's quite ritualistic. Unless I am missing out on something, then is this not the most ridiculous hand washing contraption ever? Maybe there is something cultural I'm ignorant of, but otherwise, no soap, no towel. You just flick the water onto the tile floor. Accident waiting to happen. And how symbolic of that ivory tower public sector elite pretense. No offense intended. If you have a room like that at your work, again, maybe I just don't get it. I have two showers a day because you try to wash away <laughs> the sins of your work. Knowing full well that you do it for the right reasons, but the vulgarity, the venom, the viciousness right is constant. And it's white hot. In that evening shower, which is a hot shower, it's a long one. We hear about what they like to do in their spare time. My Instagram is full of dogs and cats. Kittens, interestingly, feature earlier in the film, in the bit that I show, indicating precursors to extremism. A total self petard hoisting. And another accident waiting to happen when you go around alleging innocuous pastimes are signs of evil. A tangent, maybe, but also a bit of a word inclusion. Occupy Christchurch is shown in a few scenes listed alongside a whole bunch of dangerous internet groups, but I'm pretty sure that thing is something connected to that guy. I don't know. I don't want to look into it. I don't want to 
fall down any rabbit holes. Bottom line, worth remembering, all this is staged, not completely unheard of for documentaries to do this, but at the end of the day, it is emotional manipulation. They presumably asked this guy to take a shower in front of them and got him to act all anguished while he was doing it. I know cold showers are a thing some people do. But I gotta imagine hot ones are pretty common too, and because he's talking about cleansing the sin, it suggests these showers are hotter than normal and he's in there scolding himself, which sounds a bit like self-flagellation. So I'm not saying anything, but you want to dedicate your life to reading gross stuff on internet message boards all day. Maybe it takes or creates a certain type of person. I received two anonymous death threats at the start of the month. There is talk about these people's safety being threatened, which is not good and not intelligent, even if you think somebody is a f little f There's lists of those people who are going to get executed when Nuremberg 2.0 takes place. And I'm on that list. You know, that's really distressing. I mean, well, I mean, look, number one, I mean, if you're not currently in this crazy environment, if you're not receiving a death threat weekly, you're probably not doing your job. I mean, I, I, I received one this morning. It actually only takes one person who has been mobilized and who has the means to commit violence for something to go really horribly wrong. That's not not true, and there's not nothing to worry about. But with such a ridiculously vague scope, they're going to be proven right no matter what does or doesn't happen. I told you. What did I tell you? Didn't I tell you? Cause I told you. It's not too dissimilar to predicting that there's going to be an earthquake one day somewhere and you don't know how bad it will be but it's definitely going to happen you heard it here mm -hmm. and when did i tell you a long time ago and what did i say will happen when i told you exactly what just happened for the love of all that is holy i hope nobody hurts them there'd be no moral authority to do so that wouldn't be instantly forfeited but though it definitely doesn't justify the rest of the message this screenshot seems to allege that there may be so-called doxing going on in more than one direction i think some people may recall that stuff.co.nz were doing that sort of all last year also putting people on lists is these guys livelihood and she gets distressed just thinking about her heritage so i think accordingly not always but sometimes the actual threat level isn't easily taken too seriously <laughs> Just a thought, pushing ideological minorities further to the fringes may not have been the best strategy over the last year or so. Has there not been a correlation between that and the escalation of the threat they keep talking about? Also, with hindsight, after that thing in Queensland, maybe stop further ostracizing people who apparently seem to be depicted as having weapons here. Like, what is the point in all this? This is scary. Is there any actual solution? And so I just, you know, really think that people need to have a think about where helpful data comes from. What they go with and how they end the documentary follows a theme that has popped up before that middle class high school students have the answer. They're hoping you've forgotten the question by now. Just, I don't know, they get it. Life, I guess. This generation of digital natives are devoting enormous amounts of time and energy to making the world that they inherited better because they have a really strong sense of how many things are wrong with it. And I'm just grateful to them. I'm not trying to be mean. Generations should, in theory, possess more wisdom than the ones that came before them. But it's still accumulated gradually over time through experience, not just a given due to more widespread internet access and connectivity, isn't it? I don't know. I think some of the slogans and signs on display here, similarly worded, would probably be regarded as dangerous extremism in the hands of certain others, but whatever. <laughs> In the wake of this documentary, TDP cancelled some media briefing seminars, the given reason primarily because they only wanted certain organisations to attend. They were worried about others maybe turning up anyway and didn't want any security staff to be inconvenienced. The very existence of such secretive media briefings in the first place is a bit peculiar and TDP's overall lack of transparency may contribute to some people's negative feelings toward the group. Considering they advise both the media and the government, the onus really should be on them to let it be known if there is funding coming from somewhere else, not including her husband. I think it's a bit wacky, quite frankly, not that nor their mandate is obvious. While they are constantly lionised by the government and mainstream media like they're performing some vital duty. Dr Sanjana Hatatua from the Disinformation Project joins us to explain. It's so good to see you. I feel like we need more Kate Hannas in the world. When you actually look into it, it seems all they actually do is slag off people they have no intention of understanding scaring the crap out of everyone, causing division and making everybody hate each other more. I, I think I've got a sense of it, but how worried should we be? Betty. 
Well, where we go from here is we have to have really, really honest conversations in a way that perhaps we're a bit uncomfortable with yep. as New Zealanders. When we negotiate our differences in that thoughtful, considered, classic Kiwi manner of remembering that we've got so much more that we share than that which divides us, you know, we can start from a really good place. These vacuous, somewhat contradictory platitudes, while they minimise the possibility for these such encounters to ever happen again and otherwise refuse to engage with anybody else who steps outside the lines. They were going to be presenting in quiet a list of people who they think you shouldn't be talking to. That's why they wanted the news producers in there. That's why they wanted the journalists in there. It was a blacklist. Why wasn't I allowed to go? Because you and I both know there's a, probably a very good chance that you were on that list. And I have here a list of the names of 207 persons. They would be saying, if you listen to the platform, I mean, it doesn't mean that you're a terrorist, but there's a chance you might be. Right? And that's what they want to talk to the news producers about. Don't allow this person on. It's a blacklist. Right? Don't allow these people on. You are not going to get your hands How did you on get in here in the first place? Propaganda. What is it exactly? An echo chamber for all of our major societal concerns to then be replicated over and over again. Propaganda. Whatever you want to call this, it was funded by one government agency, mainly focused on the expertise of those working under the auspices of another government agency, broadcast on the government's television network within a day of the government's violent extremism research centre, hosting a conference where disinformation and terrorism have apparently been merged into more or less the same thing. The key security challenges facing New Zealand. Our Secret Service is launching an initiative to help us identify people who may have been radicalised. Dozens of indicators that a friend or family member could be planning a terror attack. The move comes as our spy chiefs identify a new and worrying type of terrorism. A person who is really developing an us versus them worldview. Those motivated by politics. And so it could be the COVID measures that the government took or it could be other policies that are interpreted as, as infringing on rights. What I sometimes describe as a kind of hot mess of, of ideologies and beliefs um, fueled by conspiracy theories. Something like this does not happen by accident. And those with curly hair will know what I'm talking about. Why, if you believe that the country is brimful of Nazis and white supremacists, why would you release a document which alerts them to all of the behavioural tells, presumably if you have got evil intent, you'll make some extra effort now not, not to braid your redhead daughter's hair. Yeah. Yeah. All this stuff has happened with hate speech reform once again becoming topical. So you're guaranteeing that will go through? I guarantee that I'll be introducing law that I intend to have concluded and put into law by the next election, yes. Well, that's a big promise. New Sub understands that the government has significantly watered down its hate speech proposals as they were too controversial to be palatable. Just one small change, a tiny change, in fact, the sole change will include religious communities, which were previously excluded, but the government hasn't ruled out extending it to further, future, further groups in the future. I think the aforementioned shift in paradigm Number one concern around national security, misinformation and disinformation means this particular element could really just be a symbolic gesture hoping to placate enough people, while the intelligence agencies dramatically broaden their scope, independent or not of whether future legislation is on the way too. One thing I wanted to mention was the instruction beyond the new legislation that the uh, the minister said the law commission is going to do a quote deep dive. Why do you need the law commission to do a deep dive? You have been in this process already for two years. It looks like you're kicking it to touch. Yeah, I, I'd push back against that. In the aftermath of this documentary, the Human Rights Commissioner spoke of how the production moved him. One of the most grave human rights problems confronting Aotearoa New Zealand is the tsunami of toxic misinformation and disinformation threatening respectful, evidence-informed discussion, which is the lifeblood of our democratic society. I am engaging with the Prime Minister and others on these issues. Our democracy and human rights are at stake. Seeing as the documentary relentlessly besmirched religion, I would tend to think he was referring to other stuff being in need of protection. So really, we're seeing them left on the table, but in some very vague form. And Grant Robertson said yesterday that he 
continues to want to see them to more aggressively advance. And so this is a fight we need to keep up. My wider point being, I suppose there may just be a bit of a web of coincidence going on here. Not that I'm pitching any specific conspiracy beyond the agreed upon facts. The cost to the taxpayer alone of funding productions like this should be scandalous enough. Seeing as how most of the budget looks like it was spent on acid and considering how many impoverished children there are out there who could be given another documentary about Chloe but have to watch stuff like this instead. The segue to climate stuff makes me think of that speech at the United Nations not so long ago where some form of global approach to internet regulation was promoted. There was this one time where I attempted to make the case that the people at these sorts of events they're really just unhappy with invisible boogeymen because they'll happily rub shoulders with the policy makers who are consigning us to the flames of hell or the floods or the ice depending on which thing will be the thing. And this possibly well-meaning though completely ineffectual movement may just provide some empty feel-good symbolism for those with certain tendencies to appropriate and then use as a vehicle to carry their wider ambitions. It's clever because even though I think most people secretly don't believe the world is about to end, if you want to look like a good person you sort of have to say it is anyway. Best to regard those two issues as one and the same, information disorder and catastrophic climate change. Joining others to feign disappointment that so-called hate speech laws may not for the time being go far enough while continuing to lobby for government control of information behind the scenes as per this latest moral panic. Doing your best to connect the dots between all that while deprioritizing all those other issues out there which works quite well for those currently enjoying the status quo. A mentality of such self-preservation throughout history underpinning all sorts of unnecessary overreactions. It's like there's one awful witch so now they're coming after all of us. This is like a witch thingy. It's like a witch pursuit thingy. A witch, uh... It's a witch chase. Time was when the intelligence services were never seen, never heard. But now they're loudly proclaiming your country needs you to keep an eye on those you know and if necessary, dob them in. But to some, the guide is a first step only. How do we upskill those people in our community who are much closer to people who might be potentially radicalised and get them to understand what it is they're seeing. That's our challenge. Here he is, everybody. Stephen's a bad witch. Oh, my God. I see what this is. This witch pursuit thing has you on a witch pursuit thing now. It's the dog in your neighbour aspect, of course, which is chilling. I don't know. If you see something, say something, sure. Call 111 and tell them. But maybe there are limits. I mean, what is this crazy sex shaming dragnet? And how on earth are they meant to lose their virginity if everybody thinks they're a terrorist? You're just creating a bigger divide between each group. Like that guy on The Breakfast Show was saying, it's 1.8 million New Zealanders subscribe to some type of missile disinformation. Well, that's a lot of people. Mm. A lot of the people that are going to feel like they don't belong anymore. Note, she is talking about all the 1.8 million extremists, not just the virgin ones, but the sentiment transcends. Our enemies are the banks, the 1%, the venal speculators, the unrestrained polluters, and those who would use violence against us. Those are our enemies, comrades. Not fellow Kiwis who vote differently to us. Dear vast majority of fellow Kiwis, you are not my enemy, and I refuse to be scared into believing that you are. It was your lefty mates who brought that in, by the way. I know, I know, crazy. Unreal, I know, it, eh? fucking unbelievable. They just don't I have know, any they care just, for people. They just, they just like to bloody lock people up in gulags. Calls for an urgent change to the school curriculum. With the pandemic fueling the rise of misinformation, experts believe education is key to reducing its threat. Critical thinking skills that will hopefully prevent history from repeating itself. These guys have found a niche and they're milking it for all it's worth. The day we feel a bit safer is the day that they lose a bit of their relevance. On the one hand, the parliamentary protests attracted a lot of attention, but this is as consequential, if not more so. Cheered on by a crowd of supporters, the family at the centre of a debate arrived at the High Court. It had the greatest, most significant escalation of hate, hurt and harm. Uh, the F word, the C word, the B word, the P word, every imaginable expletive. Something bad probably will happen one day. It could be tomorrow, it could be in a month, it could be in a year. Uh, hopefully it's never, but getting what comfort you can in the meantime from those who promote this climate of fear approach may not be conducive to social cohesion, let alone progress in general. Stifling and silencing collateral expression and creativity that would advance humanity in ways probably really hard to comprehend at this particular moment in time. I'm telling you people, the earth revolves around the sun. Burn him! Mediums evolve, and despite cosmetic reshuffling, a production like this, appearing around the same time as a concerted effort like all this from those with the power of the state behind them, is probably one of the more worthy things to be skeptical of. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Allow me.
allow me to respond to the Chief Human Rights Commissioner. Dear comrade, you have your entire reason for existing around the wrong way. Your job is to protect my freedom of speech, not to tell me what I can or can't fucking say. Every single attempt at hate speech or free speech restriction ends up being used by the state against the very voices of progress our democracy needs. Strangling free speech for protection and safety provides neither, you clown.